Welcome to this presentation on authoring accessible content. My name is Donnie Anderson. I'm the program coordinator for assistive technology, and I work in disability support services. In this presentation, we'll take a look at why it saves us time and better serves all our students when we bake accessibility into the document creation process. This means we'll look at making accessibility a fixed feature of our work from the very beginning, rather than another task that we have to do after the fact. Today, we want to ensure you're feeling capable and confident in making accessible content in Microsoft Word and on the Canvas Learning Management System. To that end, we'll be looking at the theory underpinning each of the four ingredients to an accessible document. Then, we'll look at how to do it in Microsoft Word and then how to do it in Canvas. After viewing today's content, if you should have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and ask. I'm happy to help. No question is too small or too large. In part one of today's presentation, we'll take a look at who accessibility is for. Spoiler alert, it's for every single person, all of your students, your colleagues, and for you, the content author. It'll make your life easier, I promise. We'll also experience together an inaccessible document using a piece of assistive technology called a screen reader. And then in part two, we'll learn the recipe for accessible documents and how to assemble this recipe in Word and in Canvas. Let's take a look at today's objectives based on Bloom's taxonomy. Upon completion of today's presentation, you'll be able to explain why document accessibility is important to users of assistive technology, your overall readership, and also to the document owner, whether that's you or a colleague, and also to your work group, because I hope you'll be collaborating with colleagues and sharing documents often. And you'll also be able to use the accessibility checker in Word and also Ally in Canvas. You'll be able to assess your own documents and those you receive for accessibility based on four foundational criteria, and you'll also be able to create new documents that meet these criteria too. Let's take a look at part one, what I call, what's the deal with accessibility? I like to begin my discussion always with this idea of a haunted document. Have you ever opened an old Word document to edit it and you would swear that it's haunted? You can't get the document to do what you want it to do no matter what you try, no matter how you try to edit it. Maybe you press the enter button once and the cursor flies down several lines. Maybe you press the tab button once and it goes over too far to the right. Maybe the spacing is messy. Maybe lines of text get smashed together and it seems like there's too little space between them, or the font or the line spacing keeps changing on their own. Some parts of the document might even be broken. While the answer to this dilemma is not anything magic, it simply requires that we structure our document properly right from the beginning using the right tools for the job. Let me be clear, what's haunting our document always stems from these points. These stem from a lack of clear document authorship standards and guidelines. That's what today's presentation is here to help you with, providing some document authorship standards and guidelines, both in Word and in Canvas. It also stems from a lack of planning. We don't make an outline of what we're going to create in terms of document, and we also don't create a reverse outline to help us organize and make sure that we haven't missed anything. We don't take a few moments that it requires to insert headings, to write our alternative text, or double check that our links are accessible. However, as in most things, taking five to 10 minutes extra today ends up saving us hours of frustration later on when we have trouble remembering whether document A is accessible or whether we went back and fixed document B. Let's take a look at some of our whys for accessibility at CBC. Accessibility is foundational to our college's mission and values. Our mission states that we seek to inspire, educate, and support all of our students in an environment of academic excellence. In order to ensure everyone has access, we need to make sure that we, our document content is accessible. Our values include student learning, where we strive to create a community and belonging. And we are also dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are dedicated to eliminating barriers to success through intentional and equitable efforts. And that includes ensuring that things are accessible. We also have obligations under Washington State Policy 188 and Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which both require that information and communication technology, including documents and content on Canvas, are accessible. I know that accessibility can seem like one more to do on our list, 
So we're going to learn how to bake it into the process of document authorship and make sure that accessibility is an integral part that we're thinking about as we create and edit our documents so that you don't have to rush to fix all of your documents when you get a letter of accommodation informing you that a student needs accessible documents. Your documents will already be accessible using best practices, so any revisions you need to make will be simple. Now let's take a look at some accessibility pitfalls that render our documents inaccessible and end up with haunted documents. First of all, let's look at what an accessible document is. An accessible document is compatible with assistive technology. As simply put, assistive technology is any hardware or software that's used to improve or maintain the functional capabilities of someone with a disability. Now, that is not a definition that you need to remember if you can remember some good examples of assistive technology. A great example of assistive technology would be a screen reader. A screen reader reads out the content on the screen to someone who is blind or low vision, and it also tells them what they're doing when they navigate using a keyboard by narrating what is happening, what's changed, what windows open, what windows closed, what was exited or what was started up. It can also be voice control. If you've ever used Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, or something else like it, then you've used a voice control. And this all originated as assistive technology for people who might not have access uh, to using the swipe function on the screen. It's also speech to text. So if you've ever dictated a message by voice, then you've used speech to text. Accessible documents follow good design principles. And because they are designed properly, they automatically also are assistive technology compatible. It's important for us to know that it's not anything special or extra we have to do. We just use the right tools for the job and the documents are accessible as a matter of course. It's automatic. On the other hand, an inaccessible document is not properly formatted. This usually happens when we use incorrect methods for achieving the right look. For example, we might simply increase the font size and bold something instead of using proper heading styles located up here when we're in Word. We might also use improper number format here, and we might also create links that look like this. The point to remember is that we're not using the built-in tools in Canvas and Word to create the proper structure. When we do this, we run into problems. It's important that you can't tell just by looking. This on the left was created using things like increased font size and bold. And it appears that there are proper headings or labels for each section. But if we look at the code on the back, we see that there is just a stream of consciousness text. There's absolutely no break in the text. And someone using a screen reader will just hear all of the text with no headings announced. And there won't be any break in the text so that they know the structure of the text. We rely on the visual orientation here to tell us what part of the text is a label or a section heading. Over here is what the person using a screen reader experiences. When we don't use proper heading structures, we force our students to use improper reading techniques. All of us want our students to become excellent readers using college level reading techniques. We often tell them that they need to scan for keywords and skim rather than reading from the beginning of the textbook like it's a novel. When we don't separate our documents into proper headings and proper sections, we actually force students who are using a screen reader to start at the beginning and go from top to bottom, right to left, all the way down our document. We, in essence, force them not to be able to use those good reading techniques that we expect all of our students to use. But don't worry, we'll learn how to properly structure our documents so that all of our students can take advantage of those great reading techniques. And now we're going to listen to a screen reader reading aloud content on a page when it's inaccessible. Here we have an example document. It's a recipe for a chocolate yogurt cake. If I try to use shortcuts to navigate headings, no next heading, no next heading, I find that there are absolutely no headings in this document. This means that although it appears that there are labels for each of the sections, these are not formatted correctly. And so someone using a screen reader would have to read from the top to the bottom, from the left to the right. They would not be able to skip to ingredients, nor down to process, nor down to yield. And so they would be required to read every bit of the recipe rather than skimming and scanning as you and I would. If I toggle to the first link, Link HTTPS slash slash www.joyofbaking.com 
you can hear that it does not provide me with a descriptive hyperlink telling me where I'll go. It simply reads out the entire URL. And I can tell you from experience that if it's a really long URL, it can sound like your screen reader is shouting at you for a long time. So it's really important that we take care and make sure that our links are accessible and descriptive. Now that we've seen what can go wrong in a document when I'm using assistive technology, let's learn how to make sure that your documents do it right. In part two, we move on to the recipe for accessible documents. Here, we're looking at the most fundamental ingredients of an accessible document. These four ingredients are document headings that are created properly in Word or in Canvas, lists that use the built-in list tool and are either completely ordered or completely unordered, descriptive hyperlinks that tell your reader where the link will take them, and alternative text on all your figures. Headings give your document hierarchical structure. Think of these headings like section labels that break your document up and allow your reader to rapidly find the text they need by providing them with guide words that act like bookmarks. Your document only ever has one heading one, or H1. Let me repeat, your document only has one H1, which is its title, and its title is its only H1. This is always the case. You only use H1 once, the H1 for the title. So once you've created your title and promoted it to H1, then all the major sections of your document are H2, or Heading 2. Within a single Heading 2, you might have one, two, three, or more subsections. Each of these subsections would be, you guessed it, Heading 3, or H3. Each H3 within H2 is called its child, and the H2 would be called its parent. Each of the three H3s has the same level of importance, so they would be called siblings to one another. Headings are hierarchical sections, and they nest within one another, like these Totoro nesting dolls pictured here. However, talking about headings in abstraction can get confusing pretty quickly. So let's take a look at a Word document example and apply headings together. Here we've opened the Microsoft Word document containing the chocolate yogurt cake recipe from before. It appears that there are headings here if we base it on the size of the font and whether or not they're bold. To tell whether they are true headings that have been created properly and will thus assist all of your readers in navigating your document, there's an easy way to check. Click on View and open the view tab. Under show, click on navigation pane. The navigation is like a tour of your document. It's an interactive outline. If you've used proper headings or if a document that you've inherited from someone else uses proper headings, they'll be listed here. You can see that this document does not have any proper headings. You can insert headings throughout your document as you type or as you create your document. However, it's best to enter your content in first and then promote only the lines of text that you want to make your heading labels into heading labels. The reason for this is sometimes when you press enter, your heading can bleed from one line of text to the next. To avoid this, it's best to enter your text in first or paste your text in from a plain text document in a program like Notepad so that you can ensure that when you go to promote your text, you're promoting only the lines of text that you want to create your labels from. To promote your text, click the home icon and open the home tab. Then highlight the text that you want to promote and then select the correct heading from your styles palette. Now notice that your text might change in terms of its size and font face. You can adjust this here afterward and it will remain a proper heading. You can see that now chocolate yogurt cake recipe is a heading one. And I only have one heading one in my document, so that's the only time that I'll be using heading one. If I take a look quickly at this document, I see that the major sections are ingredients, yield, description, and the method. And then within sections, like the method for instance, I have subsections like prepare, combine, and so on. So I'll go ahead and promote all of those major sections into H2. So that will include ingredients, yield, description, and the method. And if I look over at my navigation pane, each of these has shown up as an H2. If I want, I can change the font face 
by increasing the font size and changing the style here. If I want my H2s all to look like this, I can then right click and click update heading two to match selection. And because I use proper headings, if I go through the rest of my document, I can see that all of the H2s or all of the heading twos have updated to match automatically. In this way, as I mentioned previously, when we use proper formatting technique, then we get all of these extra bonuses automatically. Now within ingredients, I know that I have ingredients in group one for chocolate yogurt cake, group two for chocolate glaze, and group three for the garnish. So I'll click these three, and I can actually click on each line to the left of it, and then press control and hold it and select all three of them at once, and then click heading three. And this will change each of these into heading three. Another benefit of using the proper formatting is if I decide that I needed to have the chocolate glaze at the beginning, I can just click over here on the navigation pane and then drag it above, and my document changes so that it's affected that way. The benefit to doing this is that you don't have to copy and paste and then wonder if you accidentally left some of your content orphaned on a page. You can just simply click on the heading and it'll change that section so that it comes before or after, depending on where you've dragged it. Let's take a look at the same content and concept in Canvas. In Canvas, each page has its own title, and this title is considered H1. Therefore, I should take the chocolate yogurt cake recipe title and put it up here. Again, this page title is considered my H1, and it will be read out loud as such by the screen reader. The reason is that this is what's displayed at the top of the page. Next, remember I had my H2 sections, including ingredients. So I can highlight ingredients to see whether it's a H2, and indeed it is. If I highlight and then look up here, I should be able to tell its heading level or whether it's paragraph text. You can see up here in the rich content editor that heading two, heading three, heading four are all displayed. But what do you do if you need more headings? You can highlight this, again, double check up here to see what heading level the text is at, and then you can click on format, and then formats, and then select from heading two, three, four, five, six. In addition to this, you can also adjust the font by clicking on font, and then selecting, and font size. So again, I'll highlight ingredients, it's already heading two. Highlight chocolate yogurt cake, and indeed it's already heading three. This though is considered normal paragraph text. Garnish is also a heading three, and chocolate glaze, again, is a heading three. This is how you can simply apply headings in Canvas. Remember, just like in Word, it's best that you enter in your content using plain text or type directly here into the rich text editor, and then select only the lines of text that you want to promote, and then change its heading level. When you're creating lists, remember to keep your lists 100% ordered or 100% unordered. Ordered lists are those in sequences. They might be a sequence of numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, letters like A, B, C, D, E, Roman numerals like Roman numeral 1, Roman numeral 2, Roman numeral 3, and so on, etc. Unordered lists use symbols as their labels like bullets, pluses, hyphens, etc. Be sure to choose which type of list you need. Do your items need to appear in a specific order? If so, you should create an ordered list. If it doesn't matter the sequence that they appear, then you should choose an unordered list. It's important never to mix ordered and unordered lists because the screen reader cannot keep track if your list is broken or because the screen reader cannot keep track of lists that contain both numbers and bullets or letters and pluses, etc. It's important also not to break your list. This happens when you accidentally press the enter button too many times and it takes you out of your list. At this time, always make sure to use the undo button rather than simply pressing the list button again. By pressing undo, it makes sure that the screen reader can continue to read your list in its entirety. Let's have a look at this in practice in Microsoft Word. Here we have the ingredients list for the chocolate yogurt cake. You can tell that ingredients one, two, three, and four were not created correctly using the numbered list button. 
Instead, the author just typed the number one dot and then entered the text, two dot and then entered the text. However, if you click on five, you can tell that this was used correctly because when you highlight five, then the numbered list button depresses automatically. In order to remedy this, let's get rid of the incorrect numbering and then let's create a numbered list. And you can see immediately that this is incorrect because the computer is trying to anticipate the items that are missing. Also, I don't actually need an ordered list because these ingredients don't, don't need to be displayed in a particular order. The order will come later when I'm talking about the process for creating the cake. Therefore, it would be better for me to highlight all of these and then click the bulleted list to take away the list completely and then click the bulleted list again to make one bulleted list. It's really important that this remain unbroken so that the screen reader can read each item in succession correctly. Here's the same list in Canvas. It's a little bit more difficult to tell in Canvas whether a list was created correctly or not, but you can see that if I highlight these rows, this little carrot here, this downward facing arrow, demonstrates that this is indeed correct. However, this whole list is not correct because it blends an ordered list, one, two, three, four, five, with bulleted items. It's important for me to turn this off and then turn this off as well and then highlight all of my items so that they're all in one list and then click on the bulleted list if that's what I need. If I need to number the list instead, I just click simply on the downward facing arrow and then I choose from either numbers, letters, or Roman numerals if I need an ordered list. I also have the option of some circles or some squares if I need an unordered list. Remember, it's important that your list be a properly formatted list instead of just simply using numbers that you've typed yourself or pluses or hyphens that you've inserted yourself. And this is because assistive technology will read out the list as ordered list, three items or five items, etc. It's also helpful for you the author when you go back to edit your lists because it will keep your lists nice and tidy in terms of spacing and also it will automatically continue the numbering for you. Next let's talk about hyperlinks. When we create hyperlinks we should make sure that they're descriptive. Not only do they look more professional but they also tell your reader where the link is going to take them. Bare URLs are those that simply list out the web page address like https colon slash slash www.columbiabasin.edu. This would be considered a bare URL. They're really unsightly. They don't look very good, especially when they get really long. And they're also very unhelpful. You remember when I was letting you listen to the screen reader that it started reading out the entirety of the URL or the hyperlink. And that's really not helpful. And it also uh, sounds like the screen reader is yelling at you, especially when the URL gets really long. It's really important here that we don't just put in simple descriptions like click here or read more here. And the reason for this is simple. When a screen reader user is operating the screen reader, they can open up the links submenu. And when they do so, it lists out each and every one of the links that's in the page. Say that you had 10 links in your page and all of them said something like click here or read here. Then what the screen reader would read out to them would be this link, click here, link, read more here, link sign up here. The screen reader user wouldn't know based on those descriptions in succession where those links were taking them. Remember, they're not always interacting with the document in the way that you and I might where we're reading all of the context around it. They have options to quickly move from link to link and that's to help them save time because otherwise they would have to read from top to bottom, left to right, the entire document. So they have all of these submenus that allow them to rapidly move through the document in ways that are supportive of them and save them time. Instead of using things like sign up or sign up here, you could think about where the link is taking them and say something like sign up for our document training. You can decide where you should insert the hyperlink and then link only that text. And it will depend on how your text flows. So instead of clicking something like read here or read more, you could click DSS canvas page and then have the entire phrase read, read the DSS canvas page for more, and then hyperlink only DSS canvas page, and so on. This of course will depend on your text. It's just really important that you remember that somewhere in your hyperlink should explain where the link is going to take the reader. 
Okay, let's look at some of these links that are incorrect. You can see here that I have a bare URL that leads to the Joy of Baking website. That's the website of the author of this delicious recipe. So instead of doing that, I want to properly cite the author. So I'm going to highlight Joy of Baking and Stephanie Jaworski in parentheses. I'm going to right click my mouse atop the selected text. Then I'm going to click link. Then I'm going to choose existing file or web page. I'm going to confirm the text to display as the text that I selected. And then down here, I'm going to put my URL and then click OK. And you can see that my new clickable and descriptive URL is here. And then my students can follow this by clicking Control and then click. Or if this is a PDF, they can simply click. You might be wondering to yourself what to do in the event that you're going to hand out the physical document in class and that students might need to be able to type in the URL. In that instance, the best practice is always to offer both the printed handout and also access to the digital copy in Canvas. This is because students might need to have multiple ways of interacting with the document. For instance, if they need to use a screen reader or they need to use the ReadSpeaker TextAid browser extension to have the document read aloud to them. And it's also helpful if students have an unforeseen medical emergency or have to miss your class for another reason, they're able to quickly go into Canvas and get access to the documents that they need. Let's make sure that the information is there in both forms, both the URL that students would need to be able to type in themselves and also the title of the video so that it's clear to the screen reader user what it's going to send them to. First, we'll right click and we'll remove the hyperlink. We will copy the hyperlink by highlighting and then copy. We will right click and then click link. And then this time we're going to change the text to display to read chocolate yogurt cake demonstration video and then put the URL in parentheses. And then we'll make sure that the address hasn't changed any. We'll click OK. And now it gives the best of both worlds. It clearly states where the link is going to take them. So if someone is using a screen reader, it will tell them. And also, your students who are just reading the handout in class will also know, oh, this URL here is for the chocolate yogurt cake demonstration video. It's very useful for anybody who is quickly looking at what you've given them in paper format as well. Canvas works in much the same way. Let's do the same thing here. First of all, we'll highlight the link and then in the link options that come up, we will click on link options and then we'll change the text here to include the title. In this case, chocolate yogurt cake demo and then the URL in parentheses and then click done. And then it provides them with both. If we want to simply um, have this link be part of the hyperlink text, I'll just right click and click cut. I'll highlight Joy of Baking and Stephanie Jaworski. And then I will go up here to this little link here and then click the little downward facing arrow, click external link, and then insert the link here and then click done. So these are the two ways that it would work in Canvas. And our final ingredient is alternative text. Describe what you see. Simply put, alternative text is a textual description of your figure. The figure could be a photo, a graphic, a drawing, a chart, a graph, and so on. You should ask yourself, does this figure convey information? If so, it needs alternative text. And you, the author, are the best writer of alternative text because you know why you're putting this figure in your page or inside of your document or on your test. Think about this. What are you trying to convey and why is it important? Your alternative text should briefly describe both of these points. And remember, the level of description is based on your purpose. The information that you'll give someone when you're trying to teach them a new concept will be far more than if you're trying to test them. A great tool that you can use is this. Describe the figure as you would to someone on the telephone if they couldn't see it. Finally, you should know that decorative items can safely be marked as decorative. This ensures that the screen reader does not simply say image and then not give any description. If the screen reader user hears the word image and then there's no description, they will assume that there's an important figure that is missing a description and that they're missing information on the page. Let's take a look at this in practice. On our chocolate yogurt cake recipe in Word, we have this QR code 
and I can put a simple description of the QR code, letting the person know that it can be used with a smartphone or another QR code reader. In order to insert alternative text, the easiest way to do this is to right click on the image and then click edit alt text. You can see here that the current alt text is incorrect. It's simply the URL where I got the image. Instead, I'll say QR code use with QR code reader. Okay, and then I'll have to simply click off. And that one's done. So if I click on it again, it'll show me my alt text. Finally, when you're happy with your document, you can click on review and then click check accessibility with the accessibility checker. It's important to note that the accessibility checker can be helpful in finding things like images that are missing alternative text or extra spaces that will be read out loud to the screen reader user, but it actually misses a lot of important structural issues. So for instance, this document does not contain all of the headings that it should, but the accessibility checker was unable to notice that and bring it to your attention. You can see that I also have some incorrect hyperlinks here. This baking soda URL should actually be hyperlinked to baking soda here. Again, this is not a perfect science and the AI is unable to find all of the accessibility errors. It usually is only able to pull up some of the simpler errors. However, it's a useful tool along with the navigation pane. Again, the navigation pane is under view and then show navigation pane. Using both of these along with the tips that you've learned today will help you to make your Word documents more accessible more of the time. Oftentimes, adding the alt text is the easy part, but knowing how to describe the figure is more difficult. For instance, if I click on this histogram and then I click on image options, it brings up the alternative text. And how I should describe this histogram will be very different if I am trying to instruct students in a non-assessment setting on how to interpret a histogram. If it's being used for explanation, you might include some interpretation, and that might include the fact that the distribution here is skewed right because its tail is pulled out to the right. This would not be appropriate to add if this were in a testing situation. In that instance, I would simply describe the histogram uh, based on its numerical distribution, and I wouldn't provide the information about the distribution being skewed to the right because that's what I'm testing the students on. In this way, I should consider the context for the image and the import or the reason why I'm providing it in addition to the context in which it is presented to students. To add the alt text, simply click on the image to select it and then click on image options. The other option is to click down here on the accessibility checker or ally and bring that in and then check the alt text on each of the images and you just click next or previous to toggle between all the images that you have on the page. A third option is to click on the accessibility meter here. This one is green, so I know that there's no problem, but if I click on it, I can double check everything anyway and ensure that uh, there's no issue here. It also provides me with information and I can click on help for um, more ally descriptions. So ally works in the very similar way to the accessibility checker in, uh, in Word and other office products and you can uh, open Ally by clicking on these little meters throughout your page. We want to make sure that we have as many greens as possible and as few reds as possible. If you have any questions about any of those descriptions or um, the benchmarks that the checker gives you are or what they mean, you can click on help and you can also contact me at any time. And finally, I want to thank you very much for your interest in accessibility and helping all of your document readers have better and fuller access to the wonderful content that you're creating or curating. This video will be available for review. You'll receive a full list of attachments from today's proceedings, and you can use this for your review of today and also for document formatting help. And I encourage you very warmly and heartily to contact me for an accessibility consultation or with any questions you might have. Thank you.